Good afternoon and welcome. I am uh, Bill Barker, the director of the Center for Faith and Inquiry, and it is a genuine delight, uh, a real joy to see all of you here today for the annual John Mason Lecture, which is also coinciding with the celebration of the 50th anniversary of our Economics and Business Department here at Gordon College. Yeah, absolutely. to faculty, staff, uh, students, friends of the community. Uh, we have a number of distinguished individuals here with us today that actually are, have been a part, or their families certainly have been a part, and to some extension they have been a part of bringing our economics and business department to where it is today. Uh, so in addition to our distinguished speaker, who we will get to in just a moment, I also would like to welcome Susan Webb, uh, whose husband Bruce was a, a valued colleague of the community. Thank you. Uh, we also have the delight, the privilege of having three years worth of John Mason speakers here today. We have last year's uh, distinguished Mason uh, lecturer in uh, Judith Dean, Dr. Judy Dean at Brandeis. She's here with us. <laughs> of course, this year's speaker, uh, Dr. Stephen Smith, uh, also a longstanding member of the Gordon College Economics and Business Department until just recently. And, uh, and next year's speaker for the John Mason Lectureship, I am proud, uh, most pleased to announce, is our own Dr. Kristen Cooper, who's also here with us today. <laughs> now, for those of you who may be wondering a little bit about what is all the celebration of John Mason, everyone I just named was touched in some way by Dr. Mason while he was here. And so today I'd like to begin by sharing with you just a little bit about the late Professor John Mason, for whom our lecture is named. Uh, Dr. John Mason came to Gordon College in 1968, uh, the same year in which he also founded the Economics and Business Department here at Gordon. Uh, over the course of his four decades long career, until his passing away in 2007, and continuing now into the present, Professor Mason was and is admired by many students, alumni, and faculty colleagues. Professor Mason had an enduring professional and personal interest in the alleviation of poverty and suffering economically for urban communities. Uh, he had a concern for how we as Christians rightly handle economics to address these concerns. Professor Mason was also instrumental in helping to launch both Gordon's Urban Studies program in Boston, as well as the first departmental honors program here at Gordon, which is still going strong today, uh, for which we're grateful. Uh, however, Professor Mason's influence also went far beyond the Gordon campus. He served for many years as a board member, as an advisor to Boston's Emanuel Gospel Center, he was one of the founders of the Association of Christian Economists. On a personal note, I would simply add that uh, I was a former student of, of Dr. Mason, and it's difficult to communicate just how engaging he was as a professor, as a Christian leader on this campus. I remember many things about Dr. Mason. Uh, in addition to his classes and the value that they brought, his saddleback shoes, <laughs> his bow ties, uh, he and his wife, uh, Sherry, which usually is able to be with us, and sadly, not today, um, but John had great love for Sherry. They would teach students how to swing dance, uh, and, and we, we all love Dr. Mason uh, and, and Sherry continue to, to appreciate them and what they brought. In fact, we, we actually wrote occasional poems or parodies about Dr. Mason, uh, something along the lines of, Our Father Mason, who art an economist, Econ John be thy name. Done, our attention is one on financial institutions and analysis. I could go on. Uh, not to be any disrespect to the Lord's Prayer, but, uh, uh, but, uh, but indeed a great appreciation for Dr. Mason. I also remember Dr. Mason's passion for economics and the role of faith in his discipline. It was combined with his capacity for seamlessly integrating them, demonstrated by such work as his 1990 article on the framework for scripture, state, and economy. That brings me then today to one of his valued colleagues during his time here, uh, Dr. Stephen Smith, a professor of economics at Hope College since 2016, but a professor of economics here at Gordon for 29 years prior to that. I also had the distinct privilege of sitting as a student under Dr. Smith. Uh, in fact, uh, we warmly remember learning from him and seeing his passion, and there were always rumors that the IMF or the World Bank were going to woo him away from slave wages here at Gordon College. Um, but we knew that his, his intellect and his ability to integrate compassion for those in need uh, and 
to use economics as a, as a means of alleviating that. Not only was it keeping with John, what John Mason had intended, but was also something that was valued by many others across the nation and around the world. And so we were always knew that we were privileged to have Dr. Smith and his care for us personally as a professor and that faculty-student relationship as well. So it's a great privilege for us. Um, his lecture title for today is in keeping with the CFI's 2018-2019 theme of Christianity in the Majority World. Uh, he'll be speaking to us, as you can see, on the topic of global flourishing and China's test of the West. Uh, so now to introduce Professor Smith a little bit more formally, I have one of his uh, dear faculty colleagues uh, here at Gordon College, Professor Mike Jacobs. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mike Jacobs, Assistant Professor of Political Science and International Affairs, and I'm honored to welcome our guest speaker for the John Mason Lecture in Economics, Dr. Stephen Smith. With a PhD in Economics from Stanford University and a BA from Williams College, with a double major in economics and religion, Stephen is a specialist in international economics and economic development. He currently serves as a professor of economics at Hope College and is a familiar face here at Gordon, where he taught in the Department of Economics and Business for 29 years. Stephen publishes widely in professional journals and is active in groups including the American Enterprise Institute and the Association of Christian Economists. In the fall of 2016, he, he was visiting scholar at the U.S. International Trade Commission. At Gordon, Stephen chaired the Department of Economics and Business for two terms, totaling 17 years, following in the footsteps of this lecture's namesake, John Mason. The founding director of Gordon's Department of Economics and Business, Stephen made the lasting positive impacts on the college, its students, and its community. I personally am thankful for Stephen's work uh, to create the international affairs major where I now teach. As part of celebrating the 50th anniversary of John Mason's founding of the Economics and Business Department, I'm pleased today to welcome back this scholar whose depth of expertise and gracious demeanor inspire respect from his students and peers alike. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Stephen Smith. Hmm. I, I'm almost speechless, <laughs> and, and I'm so appreciative of those uh, kind introductory words. And very grateful for the chance to speak here today with, uh, with you all. Um, it's a privilege to deliver the, the, the Mason uh, lecture, the fifth annual Mason lecture. John, John epitomized everything uh, that is good about Christian higher education. He, he worked diligently to encourage students to, well, this is, this is, uh, this is Mark, Mark 12, 30, which was a, a key verse for him. He, Encourage students to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And John really wanted to help students lean into loving the Lord with all of your mind. Uh, seizing four years here to, to learn about the world and prepare oneself for, for service uh, to the kingdom of God. And he modeled all of this in his teaching and in his scholarship and in his, in his life. I'm, I'm profoundly grateful. Uh, for our friendship and for the way he mentored me for the 20 years we were colleagues here. So, the context for my talk today, let's see, there we go. The context for my talk it is, of course, China's rapid growth over the last 40 years. The scope and the duration of that growth are unprecedented in, in human history. It resulted uh, in a vast reduction in poverty and a vast improvement in material well-being. Um, in fact, the growth was fast enough and so many people were involved in that growth um, that it yielded a measurable reduction in global income inequality. Trade played a vitally important role in China's growth. 
And that topic was very well addressed uh, by Professor Judith Dean last year in the Mason, in the Mason lecture. A great credit is owed to a wise Chinese market-oriented policy reforms starting in 1978 and to wise U.S. openness to trade with China. Improved material well-being was a testimony to the power of trade and comparative advantage. And that's an experience full of lessons for other developing countries still to this day. Nonetheless, China is now at a difficult moment. And so we also are at a difficult moment. In the first section of my remarks, I want to survey China's current situation. I'm going to argue that much of China's difficulty lies with its political economy system, what I would call totalitarian statism. In the second section, I'll discuss some of the particular problems related to this set of institutions and practices. Uh, Statism creates pathologies, and China is not exempt from them. I conclude by discussing four challenges, four tests that China poses for the US and the rest of the Western world. Let me be clear here, now, this is important. When I say the West, what I mean is the group of countries that have adopted and adapted the open access software known as markets and democracy. I'm thinking of India, I'm thinking of Lithuania, I'm thinking of New Zealand, I'm thinking of Canada, and, uh, and, and of course, uh, most of Europe. So I'm thinking of that uh, really, uh, really widely. The challenges of China's current situation, I think, are going to test, are going to test us sorely. So into the context of the current situation. The burgeoning prosperity of the Chinese since 1980 is, is manifest in a, in a thousand ways. There are water parks, attractively designed urban promenades and river walks, comfortable apartments in cities and sturdy brick homes in rural areas, access to clean and fresh food, groceries uh, delivered easily, um, substantially improved health, health care and radically greater availability of higher education. I, I could go on and on and on. Uh, here we, we've got a picture of the Chinese middle class at, at play uh, because part of the prosperity has been a growth in uh, leisure time and the cultivation of the habits of, of leisure as well as of, uh, as of work. Chinese growth has not been without its uh, problems. Uh, even severe problems, which we could, which we could talk about, uh, but it'd be fatuous to deny that the overwhelming improvement in life on the ground uh, it, uh, experienced by the average Chinese person between 1980 and today has been uh, substantial. China's flourishing helped the world flourish as well. Southeast Asia and Africa have benefited from China's growth. Again, not without problems, uh, but the U.S. also has benefited from China's growth. It's startling to realize that the entire generation of Americans under the age of 40 have grown up in a world in which a Chinese average annual growth rate of 10% could be taken for granted. We complain about China's merchandise deficits with us, and we forget about China's purchases of our assets, our government debt, um, all of which has benefited us uh, very substantially. The Chinese people are energetic and entrepreneurial. They are heirs to a truly great cultural legacy, uh, evidenced in artwork across the entire continent. Uh, their achievements in poetry, the visual arts, horticulture, pottery, uh, as well as economic achievements in agriculture and architecture are, are truly uh, astonishing. Um, the Chinese, as any people would, uh, deserve to flourish. But 40 years of growth have brought China to a paradoxical moment. With an average income of about $9,000 a year, they're at about the level of Kazakhstan, 10% lower than Mexico. Looked at that way, 
China is poor, and it quite legitimately wants to keep growing. But powering through, say, from $9,000 a year to $20,000 a year per person would put it at the level of, say, Lithuania or Greece right now, about 15% lower still uh, than Portugal. So even another more than doubling of their income uh, would leave China still not really rich. So this is the obvious paradox. In absolute terms, the size of the economy is already enormous. It's about two-thirds the size of the U.S. if we measure it just in dollar terms, and it's about a quarter again bigger than the U.S. if we measure it in terms of its domestic purchasing power capabilities. Uh, uh, Yet individuals in China feel small and poor, but the community of nations now experiences China as large and powerful. So the specific ways in which China grows in the future, the specific terms by which China engages the world, the specific institutions under which the people of China live matter more now than ever. They matter for the Chinese, but for the world at large, those details may make all the difference between sustainable global flourishing and global floundering, or worse. One of the, of course, one of the most uh, salient reminders of China's growing, uh, growing prosperity is the construction in its major cities. Here's a, a picture of, um, in Shanghai of the currently the, the, the tallest uh, skyscraper in, uh, in, uh, in China, the, the Shanghai Tower. I want to come back and make a point about that tower in, uh, in just a minute. It's the, it's the big one in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to talk about, I need to turn next to uh, statism with Chinese characteristics. The past decade has seen a, an important change in the character of China's trajectory. It was possible until about 10 years ago to think that wealth, uh, that, uh, that uh, excuse me, it was possible to think until about 10 years ago that with wealth, China would continue economic liberalization and begin political liberalization. That has not happened. Politically, China is not simply authoritarian, but is increasingly totalitarian. The Great Firewall of China, that separates most Chinese from news of the world, is real, as is the repression of religious groups, particularly the Muslim Uyghurs in the west of the country, but also uh, the tens of millions of fellow Christian believers uh, in major Chinese cities and in the countryside, uh, the continent over. Xi Jinping uh, is now declared president for life, a frequent tactic of despots everywhere. It never ends well. While tens of thousands of workers scrub the internet of any criticism of the Communist Party and keep track of the miscreants who dare post such things. Less obvious, less prominent, but of great significance is the fact that economic liberalization slowed to a crawl after 2003. At that time, the Hu Jintao <coughs> government affirmed the dominant role of state-owned banks and state-owned enterprises in the economy. Now, in Xi Jinping's second term, the Chinese government has doubled down on state-led rather than market-led economic strategies. State-owned enterprises are being consolidated to form gargantuan firms meant to be failure-proof national champions. Private property rights, particularly in rural areas, are weak at best. China is thus very much a statist economy, one in which private firms and markets are allowed to exist, but are dominated by state-owned firms and government control in virtually every industry. So in both political and economic terms, China's current totalitarian statism really is different from Taiwan and South Korea's authoritarian statism, which evolved relatively peacefully into genuine economic and political liberalization by the late 1980s. Now, anyone who's visited China and walked along the streets of its cities and towns might be astonished to hear that, the, that, that, the, uh, that it's a statist economic system with the state dominating economic life. The vibrant commercial culture at street level is delightful to participate in and wonderful to see. 
Uh, the Chinese have a, a, a flair for entrepreneurship, and that drives uh, commercial development when given scope uh, to operate. And so for Westerners often visiting China, the economy looks kind of normal. Um, there's, there's, uh, there's banks, your ATM works, it's beautiful. Your, you know, the ATMs at the banks work great, you can get cash out. Uh, the buildings look, look fantastic, like the, like the Shanghai Tower. They're full of, full of commercial tenants. Um, the airlines look great. You can book a ticket somewhere uh, at whatever class of service you, you want. Um, they have a great safety record. Um, it all looks kind of normal and modern to most Western eyes. But a statist economy is most definitely not a market economy. It's not even kind of a tightly regulated market economy. Behind the scenes, Chinese national and provincial governments substantively direct how the economy runs. They do this in large part by literally owning and running key firms in most industries. So Chinese national government owns the four largest banks and many others. And so they control access to bank credit, to, to loans. The state owns thousands of other firms across the economy, the largest steel firms, the largest automakers, and their joint ventures with foreign automakers, uh, the biggest chemical and insurance companies, the airlines, oil and natural gas, telecommunications. Uh, Shanghai Tower was entirely built uh, by the government, and it's entirely state-owned. So, so private property and markets are permitted, they exist, uh, but the state is driving the bus. The state's economic power is only weakly constrained by property rights and rule of law. It's easy for state-owned enterprises to acquire land for expansion at knockdown prices. It's easy for the government to block a private firm's investment in ways that leave the firm no recourse. The fact that bank lending goes overwhelmingly to state firms means that capital is wasted on low-value but well-connected projects. State planners' chronic inability to anticipate precisely where successful new firms and industries will emerge means that, the, it means that many important investment opportunities are missed. And of course, the deeper problem is that in statism, state-owned firms serve political ends first, not economic ends. These firms' unearned privileges inevitably harm their ability to, sub, to serve the common good. Large subsidies protect their employees at the expense of the rest of the economy, and other economic policies get distorted in order to help them. Uh, for more than the past decade, the rate of return on assets owned by state firms uh, has been less than half of the rate of return at private firms. Uh, American Enterprise Institute's uh, resident China scholar Derek Scissors, uh, noting that the private sector creates 80% of the new jobs in China, uh, calls this a spectacular misallocation of capital. He's absolutely, he's absolutely right. Uh, it's, a mis it's a capital misallocation that China can uh, ill afford. China's growth is now uh, slowing and is in the range, uh, officially, of 6 to 6.5% 6 uh, per year. Um, now, on the one hand, uh, a slowdown of economic growth after 40 years of torrid growth uh, is something to be expected. China's exhausted the easy gains to be had uh, from uh, its infrastructure investments and its, uh, manu and its exports of low-tech manufactured goods. It also now faces a pretty significant demographic challenge uh, the generation that was born prior to the implementation of the one-child policy is now about to retire. And what that means is that the share of workers in the total population is about to really fall. And that's going to be a big drag on, on growth uh, going forward. So to get to $20,000 per year or so per person, China's productivity needs to double. And that can only now come from innovation and skills-based technological improvements with increased consumption rather than investment driving aggregate demand. Chinese government acknowledges all, all of this. This is very much on the, on the public uh, record in China. Um, what's not on the public record is, is that there is credible evidence that the slowdown, in, in fact, 
uh, is much more significant than the official statistics suggest, and there's credible reports that actually China right now is growing uh, somewhere between 2 and 4 percent a year. So the, the, the really grave matter here about this uh, is this. Markets and a vibrant private sector embedded and arising from Chinese commercial culture are perfectly capable of marshalling a transition to a more innovation-based, productivity-enhanced growth rate uh, if they're given breathing room and institutional support to do that. What would that take? Well, uh, private firms would need full access to credit from state-owned banks. Uh, uh, credit decisions would need to be depoliticized and made on an arm's length basis on the basis of, of, uh, of uh, actual economic fundamentals. You would need freedom of the press. Accurate financial and policy information needs to be widely dispersed, widely available to public and to firms uh, in order to guide wise investment decisions. You need firms, uh, you would need full recourse in the court system to impartial contract dispute settlements. People would need, and firms would need, full protection of intellectual property and other property rights under the rule of law, not the, what some people call the rule by law in China now. Um, particularly, property rights would need to be defensible against the state. Believe it or not, uh, we need introduction of habeas corpus so that the CEOs of private firms, let alone ordinary people, couldn't be abducted by the state and held incommunicado and without charge indefinitely. This is the pivot that China is not making. China's totalitarian statism is now likely to inhibit growth rather than promote it. The very reforms China needs to foster another generation of growth require economic and political liberalization that would undermine the government's political control. So it, 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 here you have an economist making an actual forecast. Uh, you know, if I'm proved wrong, I'll be the happier for it. But, but the way things look now, Totalitarian statism will very much slow China's growth needlessly in order to delay the achievement of economic and political freedoms for the people of China. So we come now, really, to the test of the West. The conventional wisdom right now is that China's size and wealth are, are large enough to put the US and its Western allies and the, and the West, rest of the um, democratic and market-oriented West um, in a new and uncomfortable position. China, on its own, can shift the global rules in the game of trade, finance, and environment, and national security, and it's, and it's certainly not been shy about touting the benefits of statist economic development. It, it's been actively encouraging the, the so-called Chinese model in Africa and in parts of Southeast Asia. And we've got examples of this. In the, in the entire Belt and Road Initiative, and of course in China's new uh, assertive military posture in the South China Sea. So at the very least, uh, in the conventional wisdom, the prospect looms of a US uh, awkwardly and deeply interdependent with an ideological adversary, um, to whom very inconveniently the US owes approximately $1.1 trillion. <laughs> <laughs> If things go badly, there's the potential for a renewed Cold War in which two ideologically opposed trading blocs settle in for a long face-off. Face in this sense, of course, uh, Ch China would, would indeed, does indeed, pose a deep and significant test for the West and, and, and of the rest of the world, too. I, I think the conventional wisdom isn't wrong, but I think it's incomplete. It assumes that China's statist economic system will continue to, to deliver relatively high growth in, indefinitely, uh, even if lower than in past decades. I no longer think that that's likely. Um, and I worry that far from easing the strategic difficulty of the US and the, and, and, and the West, 
A significantly slower growing and more politically repressed China may make a harder test uh, for us. So this is a time, I think, for really clear thinking and a, and a long game. I think this is a moment where uh, we need to think clearly about the U.S. as much as about China. So, for your consideration, four, four tests. Can the U.S. public come to understand what it means to live with another really large country in the world? I don't mean necessarily accommodating it um, all the time, but what does it mean to engage it and live with it uh, when it's of the size that China is? Uh, if you want an example of, of, of not coming to grips with this uh, well, think no further than about the debate about global warming. Um, the Green New Deal was proposed um, a few weeks ago um, by members of the U.S. Congress. Um, uh, talking about solving global warming questions by uh, the U.S. radically redesigning its economic structure and uh, eliminating um, emissions or going to net zero emissions within, uh, within a decade. Uh, no mention of China in that, uh, in that, in that plan. That's, uh, that's an example of, of a real problem we have in the United States. We live in a different world now compared to 40 years ago where U.S. policy no longer is dispositive for what happens in the rest of the world. Um, what, happened, what China does is, is in many cases going to be as important or more important than what the U.S. does. And that's certainly the case with greenhouse gas emissions where China's emissions are already so much larger than those of the United States that really the whole game regarding greenhouse gas emissions has to be about controlling China's emissions. <coughs> Still thinking about, about us and what it takes for us to think clearly, uh, can the West, and particularly the U.S., learn to not blame China for problems that are not caused by China? <laughs> <laughs> this shouldn't be hard, but it is. <laughs> I'm going to put a graph up here. What this graph shows is a decrease in the proportion of the U.S. labor force that works in manufacturing. And we've got a long time series here, 80 years, from 1940 through the, the, through the present. And you can see that in the 1940s and, and immediately after World War II, there was a big bulge in, in U.S. manufacturing. We, we, we bumped up our manufacturing labor, labor force to, to, fight, to fight the war. Um, but then, starting in the 50s, uh, there's been a long, steady decline in the share of manufacturing in the, in the U.S. labor force. A long, steady decrease in the relative size of manufacturing in our, in our economy. It defies reason to say that when China joined the WTO, right there, that was the problem. Right there, that was it. In 2001, when China joined the WTO, that's what's, that's what's causing problems in US manufacturing. We, we kid ourselves if that's what we're thinking. Um, what we need to engage in, if we're generally, genuinely concerned uh, about problems in rural communities and problems in smaller cities, with uh, deindustrialization, what we need to be concerned about are the, the, the actual drivers of, of those, those things, the, the factors that are contributing to decreased mobility of U.S. workers. That's a big issue. Um, factors contributing to uh, lack of education and poor quality education and all those other kinds of much harder, harder questions. Uh, China really can't be blamed for what's happening in the U.S. heartland. Um, but what we can do is uh, bestir ourselves to marshal existing global governance architecture and existing global governance institutions to encourage China towards political and economic reform. This will take patience and uh, sustained resolve. I, I hope we have it. Uh, but there's a number of things we could do that we're not really doing yet. So just in terms of protecting open travel in the South China Sea, 
Uh, we need to engage our Southeast Asian allies in, in that. Um, there, there should be ships from multiple countries traversing those, those waters, military ships from multiple countries traversing those waters, uh, from countries with which we have, in fact, <laughs> mutual defense treaties. Uh, we need to engage those alliances to, uh, uh, to protect uh, open ocean travel. And the much maligned WTO, World Training System, also has resources in it that would allow us both to continue to engage China while challenging it on important, crucial matters. So, for instance, um, under existing WTO rules, uh, excuse me, sorry. Uh, under existing WTO rules, um, it's possible uh, to um, stop trading uh, with a partner or stop trading in goods with a partner uh, that are made by prisoners. And uh, that authority has never been exercised by, by a country, uh, but if the U.S. was to publicly stop accepting exports from China of products made by prisoners, this would in, in fact send an important signal to China about its existing WTO obligations that it needs to live up to. Um, and I think finding selective, finding selective uh, spots like that to stand up for human rights and to stand up for the rule of law it is a really good strategy for the U.S. and the West in the current circumstances we're, we're in. I think of this as kind of an IJM approach to, um, uh, to um, engagement. Um, it's, not about, it's not about containment, it's about engagement, um, active engagement that collaborates where possible while wrestling for change in, 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 in places. And what makes it, I think, a, what commends the IJM approach, the International Justice uh, uh, Ministry's approach uh, to me, is, is that IJM doesn't stand outside of a country and dictate to a country what it should do. It, it works within the country's legal system to ask that the country abide by its own laws. And I think that would be a really constructive stance for the United States to take with respect to China. And a much more productive way to approach issues with the Chinese um, compared to the, the blunderbuss we're using right now of, 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 of tariffs, which uh, affect, uh, which, which harm us, which harm US firms in China, and which harm firms in China that, that aren't stealing intellectual property or acting in ways that um, uh, that, that harm U.S. national interests. Above all, I'd like to see this uh, approach of active engagement um, embraced by, uh, consciously embraced by a carefully cultivated set of uh, a coalition built by, uh, built by, um, uh, built by U.S. Uh, influence. I think the final test has to do with uh, the, the way I put it here. Um, can we our, ourselves at, at home um, resist the state-led model for economic life that China espouses around the world? Do we ourselves have the courage of our convictions about the merits of free speech, free enterprise, equality of opportunity, and democratic governance? In my judgment, nothing other than a, a democratic market system would befit the inherent dignity of the Chinese people. We should settle no less for ourselves and move heaven and earth to assist the Chinese in coming to it as well. And I think Christians in particular should have a clear conscience in advocating for this in the U.S. and for China. It's not about arguing that markets and democracy are perfect. They certainly are not. And uh, students who take my courses are aware of the, the time we spend thinking about instances of market failure and government failure and the kinds of economic modeling and, and, and issues that come up in dealing with uh, the shortcomings of democratic governance and, and markets. Nor is, nor is this about pushing China to be exactly like the United States. Uh, which it will never be. Uh, rather, it's about the fact that democratic capitalism, there, I've said it again, 
uh, offers a, a practical way to protect civil freedoms and promote economic well-being together. It offers a broad avenue towards flourishing, along which practical wisdom and theological insight can walk hand in hand. We humans flourish when we live in families and community with one another that allow us to give full expression to the habits of life and character that reflect the imago dei in us. This requires institutions that allow considerable personal freedom, freedom of association, speech, and press, and that enforce property rights, property rights being necessary for exercising creativity and stewardship and civic responsibility with real personal agency. This also requires a state that administers the rule of law and embodies justice in, in, in the construction of a significant social safety net and in other important uh, and other important legal institutions. So it's right here that we meet John Mason again. John's life as a scholar, his life's work as a scholar, was to discern principles for current economic policy implicit in the Old Testament law and the prophets. His view was that the law given to Israel by God must embody internal principles relevant for all ages even if the specifics might vary from era to era. Uh, he made his most significant argument in this respect in an article co-written with Kurt Schaefer entitled The Bible, the State, and the Economy. And this is the article referenced by uh, uh, Dr. Barker uh, just a minute ago. This appeared in the Christian Scholars Review in 1990, and it won the award that year for the best article. But I think it's, it's held up really well uh, since then, too. On the basis of a detailed exegesis, John and Kurt argued that, the, that in the Bible, in, in the Old Testament law, there was a broad norm constraining the state. That's their phrase, a broad norm constraining the state. Uh, namely, um, a norm of, of justice and righteousness. Uh, in an era subject to the temptation towards an uncaring individualism, this norm would require the state assertively to ensure that all individuals are equipped with human and physical capital that they need in order to flourish. In other eras, subject to the temptation to concentrate power and use it improperly, that norm would require a greater emphasis on individual freedoms and a lighter footprint for the state. No state on earth, of course, meets that challenge, but China particularly does not. So I encourage you to work in ways large and small towards a future in which Chinese citizens are free to speak and associate, and in which the Chinese state is accountable to genuine democratic governance. Democratic capitalism and Chinese characteristics would look quite different than that in the United States in many ways, just as democratic capitalism in Japan is different from that of the United States, or in Denmark for that matter, but all recognizably of a kind. Shared prosperity, trade, thick ties of social and economic intercourse, would mark a flourishing U.S.-China relationship, just as they do the current relationship between the U.S. and Europe. The world and the U.S. Uh, will be the better, the better we can rise to those tests. Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs> Folks, now we come to the fun part. Let's have some questions. I'm, Looking forward to hearing and speaking with, uh, with, with all that you might be thinking about. Oh. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for sharing with us. I'm wondering how your recommendations would apply specifically to Gordon, where we have um, students from China, students who are interested in working and living in China in the future. Um, how do we train and uh, be an ascending kind of place in the good version of what you're talking about. That's a challenge, isn't it? And and it, it needs to be acknowledged, you know, that um, that in other U.S. campuses there, there's um, uh, there's pressure put on Chinese students sometimes to to not speak openly and to uh, you know for fear of what of reprisals that might that might occur uh, back home. Um, you know, I think, I, I think, um, 
this is a, this, that's a really that's a really hard hard question. I think pre prepare one's oneself uh, to um, to make a case for for freedom despite its messiness. I think I think in Chinese culture uh, there's such a there's a premium placed on harmony and and um, and calm. And I think I, I think the the Chinese government gets some traction when it complains about when it points to when it points out the messiness of Western politics and the vicissitudes of uh, of, of policy debates that, that get, get rude and, and ugly and 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 can at times be honestly dysfunctional um, uh, in Chinese culture. That's that's considered deeply problematic. Um, I think the test of history is, is that the dysfunctionalities of totalitarian statism are greater. Um, and I think, that's, I think that's the case to, to make, is that be, 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 ready, be ready to speak a good word about, uh, about the potential for free markets and free politics to, to guide a country well, even if, it's, even if it is messy and awkward. Thank you very much. Um, you use the term totalitarian statism that you've coined. Um, I'm curious, is that different enough from, say, Maoist communism, or even using a term like socialism? Um, you make the distinction. I'm curious, what are the significant differences? I'm glad you asked that, because uh, I, uh, I, I have given that some thought. The, the, the differences are, are at least twofold. Uh, the first is that in the uh, in in, um, in the pure communism practiced by the by the Soviets and then by the Chinese from forty nine through seven through seventy eight, um, there really was no private sphere at all. Um, every, everything everything was was nation, nationalized, um, and um, the um, uh, the state plan was a was a was a very pres pres prescriptive plan and very grand very worked out in granular detail uh, for every sector of the economy. This is now the state is in best practice now is is more uh, is is um, um, more flexible, um, wanting to take advantage of, of things that are learned um, uh, along along the way in, in, in channeling resources. Still very much state directed, but but not going to persist um, at least in principle, uh, not going to per persist. Uh, um, and more nimble than the old Soviet model was, or old Chinese model was. The other really big difference is that it's globally engaged. It, uh, one of the tenets of of the you know the old school socialism era was was that uh, it, it, you'd um, uh, you, you didn't want to have con connections with the capitalist West. You, you didn't want to transact with with other economies. It was best to be as self sufficient as possible. Uh, the Chinese communists have have entirely repudiated that. They're, they're, they want the benefits of trade. Uh, they want the uh, they want the, the learning that comes with trade, the experience that comes with trade, um, uh, the productivity enhancements that come with trade. They 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 want that, and and uh, they're they're doing little to signal that they're backing away. The, the Chinese government right now is doing little to signal it's backing away from. From uh, from global and global engagement, and and I'm certainly not uh, suggesting that the U.S. policy should be anything other than continued engagement with, with China as well. Um, that'd be a start of an answer. Yeah. It's nice to have you back. <laughs> Thank you, um, Professor Crisman. Um, I was curious about your four tests. Yeah, uh, maybe you can go back to the slides with them just. So, as a child of the 80s and 90s, is, if we put Soviet Union in for almost all of these tests, there's, it seems like there's some def definite analogies, and, and uh, I'm just curious whether you think that's a legitimate analogy or not, basically. I, I, not because it's the same in every way, obviously, but especially your first two tests, uh, which are more about the US, 
and kind of uh, like, you know, can we not see everything as caused by the evil boogeyman of the Soviet <laughs> Union, right? I mean, that really resonates with my childhood anyway. So I'm curious, like, or, or even the other big player, like when you said that first question about, you know, can we see ourselves as having another big player? Well, duh, it was the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc. So of course we can, but we forgot about it. So I'm just curious, <laughs> right. like, do you we see the lessons to be learned from that? Or is it just completely different? And if you believe Tom Clancy, we just have to maybe have a big arms race that they can't win or something. And I don't know. That was the question. So, so um, there, there are there are some, there are some similarities. There are some similarities, and and um, you know the the um, in, in retrospect, the the uh, the Soviet Union uh, in its isolationism and its wanting to to seal itself off in, in the eastern in the eastern bloc um, uh, may have made life. Significantly easier for us uh, than, than we're now looking at with with China, with whom we are now very deeply, uh, deeply and and not inappropriately interconnected. Um, you know, you know, an IR specialist, an international relations specialist, looking at what I just said, might might say, I'm I'm simply describing what it looks like on the ground when when the globe is shifting from one hegemon to a, to another. You know, it's always going to be awkward. You know, until the, the new top dog gets to set the rules, and the and the and the beta dog has to you know sucks it up and lives with it. Um, uh, the last time there was a transition of hegemon in the global uh, order, uh, it was stuck, extraordinarily uh, you know uh, unique and un unusual, unprecedented to, to have to have the the hegemonic leadership you know the baton pass to to a country. So closely aligned in culture and values and governments with uh, with the previous hegemon, I and mean, that was just remarkable. You know, the in the 1800s and early 1900s, uh, through the middle part of the 20th century, uh, the the transition there um, between the U.S. and the U.K. Um, so I think uh, I, I think, however, that the Soviet Union probably. You know, I'd have to check the figures on this, but I think one really big difference between the current situation and, and the Soviet case is that not, not only are we deeply engaged with China, but China now has, has legitimate influence around the world that the Soviet Union never had. Uh, it, it's got, it, it's got a, 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 a putatively successful model of economic development that it is, that it is uh, selling to, to countries in Latin America, and, and particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa. Saying, "Be like us. This is how it's done," and 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 it looks good. It, it, that's, a, that's a credible promise that the Soviets were never able to, to, to make, uh, particularly after the '60s. Um, so, so it's it, it's a it, this is a I think this is different. I think this is different with some similarities. Thank you for. Speaking, um, so you mentioned in your response just now of um, China's, you know, example to especially Africa, be like us. So how do we, and you mentioned the dangers and the tests um, to the West of China's flourishing. So how do we I guess, warn countries when following in China's footsteps, considering they're such a primary like example of modern development? <coughs> Well, you see, I could say this is where the economics ends, and I hand off to the IR folks. <laughs> um, and 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 in truth, and in truth, this remains somewhat opaque to me, my, my, myself. Um, you know, uh, you've heard me. I'm I'm not talking about you know the we're not talking about the the U.S. Um, um, uh, you know, we're certainly not talking about the U.S. sort of in insisting that that countries uh, pursue uh, U.S. favorite policies. We're not talking about uh, about the use of force here in any in any way. Um, I think I think what I, I think what we what we need to do is, with like-minded nations, um, make uh, make attractive opportunities for collaboration among uh, with with us that. That um, uh, that that beat out that that beat out the the appeal of of um, of, um, of tying tying oneself economically to China and its and its model. You know, 
Um, I think history may show that one of the gravest mistakes of the Trump administration was on its first full day in office scrapping the TPP. Um, because that was an arrangement uh, amongst most of the democracies in, in, in Asia to um, reduce trade barriers and investment barriers among, amongst them, and in particular to have a, 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 really, a really nice, um, I thought, quite fair dispute settlement mechanism, a, a kind of a, a rule of law uh, mutually agreed upon that would allow us amicably to settle any commercial disputes that, would, that might ar arise amongst us. And I think modeling the rule of law for China and Chinese citizens is, is actually really maybe one of the very best things we can, we can, we can do. Um, um, examples of holding you know, authority to, uh, ho holding authority to account um, uh, when authority has misstepped um, are just, are just uh, will, will really resonate with the, with the Chinese public. Of course, that's, that's why the totalitarian aspect of, of China's situation now is so troubling because uh, of the, that, that message, that, that ex those examples don't necessarily translate through to the, to the population. Um, you know, the, um, uh, you know, the, these, these, aren't, these aren't exactly comparable uh, um, examples, but, but uh, the U.S. is widely known in Asia for removing its military bases when asked to by governments. Um, at the height of the Vietnam War, uh, Thailand asked the U.S. to remove its air bases providing important you know, strategic military services to, to, the, to the war effort in Vietnam at that time. And, and the U.S. did. Within a matter of months, they were gone. Um, Sri Lanka is now dismayed at the terms at which they signed an agreement to hand over their main port to Chinese operation. Um, they've asked for, not for the Chinese to leave, but for a renegotiation. They're getting nowhere. And I think that's an instructive comparison about the difference between what it means to live in a democratic, market-oriented uh, world with the rule of law as opposed to the rule of power. And, and um, I, I, think, I think leaning into those, in, into those moments is, is uh, important. Uh, both per uh, yeah. Thank you. Hi, thanks so much for being here. I wonder if you could think of any examples of countries or economies that could serve as models or at least as laboratories for some of the hopes and changes that you're proposing for China um, that, that, that we might be able to look to um, and, and learn from. Well, I, I'm glad you asked that question because it reminds me of Taiwan. And Taiwan's, Taiwan is uh, really significant. It is a, it is a entirely Chinese cultural country, um, run democratically, and it's it's, it's it has more state involvement in its economy than the U.S. does. Uh, but it's but but it's but it's not a statist economy. It's, it's very very much so, you know uh, within the within the broad field of market uh, market oriented. Economies. And Taiwan stands as a living daily reminder of, of what the Chinese people can accomplish. Um, it's a living daily reminder that, yeah, actually, uh, of course, of course, the Chinese can, can live under democratic gover governance. Um, and it's been dismayed to me the extent to which. Um, U.S. successive U.S. administrations um, have trimmed their words and reduced their references to Taiwan in public, in order so as not to ruffle Chinese feathers. And I think you know mainland Chinese feathers. And I think actually, if we're talking about um, important ways to to important ways to signal 
to, to China that, uh, that business as usual can't really, can't really work, it would be to, to speak more about Taiwan and to, um, and to encourage U.S. firms and U.S. citizens to, to refer to Taiwan by the name that Taiwan wants to be referred to and not by the name that the, that, um, the People's Republic of China wants Taiwan to be referred to as. Um, so I was wondering um, if you said you wanted to reform the political and economic side of China, um, considering, as you said, Taiwan kind of was the model, but then Taiwan's a very small island with a very little population, and China is a much, much larger yes. country with a lot of people, and being um, democratic in China, it's very difficult, um, very, very difficult because of the amount of people there. So uh, my first question is, um, do you think that would be beneficial to bring a democratic regime into the Chinese country? And my second question is, how would you see that benefiting the whole like political, like world political order as a big picture? So, so my answer to your first question is yes. I, I absolutely think uh, the Chinese people deserve uh, democracy. Um, and, and, and yet I'm not arguing that it should be imposed externally. I, you know, I, I, I've completely acknowledged that it's something that the, the Chinese people are going to need to decide for themselves and implement for, for themselves. Um, I would like to see U.S. policy geared towards making that an easier choice. And, and, uh, um, um, uh, and, and I could imagine a scenario where, where that happened uh, uh, slowly, but organically and naturally. Um, you know, um, a, um, uh, the, the, there's been, the, the past 10 years have, have really been, have really been, a, a, have really marked a change. Uh, uh, until, until 10 years ago, it, it looked as if there might be the slow introduction of elections at village levels. Um, uh, with perhaps even possibly down the road some candidates not approved by the Communist Party being allowed to stand for village council. Um, and um, the, the fact that those reforms have not taken place is, is and, and, and instead the surveillance state in China is now being ramp, ramped up, is a very bad sign. Um, but, but the, I think a natural path for China towards a democratic reform would, would be to do it incrementally. And I think a, I think a government that was, that was perhaps less scared of its own people might be willing to take some of those baby steps towards, towards that. Thank you, Stephen, for all your ideas and uh, raising a lot of thought-provoking issues. So um, maybe some questions or maybe a few comments as a Chinese American uh, who, uh, who grew up in uh, the old age. So I've seen uh, quite a bit cultural revolution and then you know, the opening of China. And um, the situation is actually a lot more complicated than quote unquote the West can handle uh, because but you're looking at a mix of politics, economy, and the cultural differences. The Chinese <clears throat> actually is a lot more shrewd than many Westerners perceive them to be. So like we live by a set of rules, but when the Chinese look at the book of rules, the set of rules, they have their way of manipulating the rules to work to their advantage. And I'm speaking this uh, even though I really like to have a strong China because it has brought so much um, prosperity to a lot of people, millions of people. And yet, uh, with the persecution of Christian brothers and sisters, uh, we're also seeing a lot of hardship. So, you know, this is why I'm coming from. Um, the engagement with the Chinese uh, is helpful and I think the, <clears throat> the more 
the U.S. presents itself as a strong country uh, with no division. Right now, is really in chaos. The whole country is like really divided, very dysfunctional to the outside. So that could be held up by the Chinese government as an example to the Chinese people. See, don't be like them. Like they are a democracy. Look at how crazy things can get. So it's better to adopt our, ad, ad, abide by our own system because we are stable, like we're doing well and so forth. And the other thing is the global mechanism, like the TPP, the, um, the World Trade Organization, the UN, uh, the Chinese is pushing this uh, Belt and Road project. It's earning the hearts and, of, and minds of so many countries. If you have a vote, guess who would lose? America. China gets all the votes already because they have loans all over the world. And who, whoever pays the piper calls the tune. So you're going to see the Chinese being increasingly dominant in those organizations. Now, I'm not agreeing or disagreeing with the current administration's many policies. It's just a fact that we have to reckon with. And so, as a result, I think one thing as an educator now, uh, I really worry about our students in America and uh, around the world uh, not being well informed about the pitfalls of socialism, uh, but rather just looking at the propaganda that well, wow, China is the wealthiest country in the world. Uh, you know, they have all these multi-billionaires created every week. Uh, we should be more like them. Like, what's wrong with you know being a socialist country? And then you know, to the extent that we are now seeing so many politicians proposing that we should adopt that, uh, in spite of what we have done in advancing the, uh, the the U.S. and many many countries around the world to lift uh, lift people out of poverty. So, in other words, let's get our young better educated and let them show the power of the democratic system and also free enterprise. That is where the common good uh, rely. Thank you. We've, we've got time for one more question. Um, I have a question about um, possible possibility of uh, Chinese government getting sort of returning to the pre-free market policy era, uh, considering uh, they're reinforcing the supervision on like IT companies, uh, putting uh, uh, Communist Party uh, committees in, in order to supervise what they're doing, right. and making sure they're on track of. Uh, the desired track of the party. So right. um, it might be too broad to um, answer, but um, no, no. These are very troubling in terms of in terms of having a a, a a real market economy that's that's generating innovation that drives economic growth. These are these are real real troubling um, happenings. The the I, I think. And I, I think uh, I, Professor Zhang and I completely agree that people need to be informed about, better informed about this. You know, you have you have a company like um, like Ten Tencent, you know, and and um, the government apparently shut. I say apparently because they, they, they haven't stated this publicly, but it's the it's the only it, it's the only thing. Um, there was ten months when last year when they didn't issue a single new new game, and and that's. Uh, you know that's arbitrary. That that's um, that's very damaging to to the company's um, employees and, and uh, stockholders. Uh, it's very damaging to um, uh, incentives for doing creative work in IT. Um, the um, and, that, and and you're quite right about the the, the du direct supervision of firms through the em embedded uh, members of the Communist Party um, in. Um, Boards of directors and in, and in executive suites. Um, that's a that is that is a that is a problem, and it suggests it suggests that that the uh, that the regime is not thinking about reform anytime soon. I, I'm afraid that's really the only way to, to read that.
thank you so much. This, uh, at this point, we especially want to thank uh, Professor Smith, and I believe your wife is here with us as she, well today, and so yes, welcome is. back to Gordon. We're so thrilled to have you all with us. Thank you for this enriching, insightful lecture and, and Q&A. Um, we also want to thank our economics and business department. We are, uh, as an alumni of this college, as well as a current faculty and staff member, uh, we're very proud of you all and thankful for the work that you do, as with all of our faculty, who I see many uh, current formal faculty here with us today, and it's always a, a pleasure to appreciate what you all do. Thank you to our students, we appreciate you coming, uh, and thanks to our distinguished guests. Uh, this concludes our lecture, but please join me one more time in thanking Professor Smith.